Hi everybody, Keith Tanner here from Flying Miata and today I'm going to be talking about struts and why Miatas don't have struts. It's been something that's been going on since the Miata came out. People are always calling the shock absorbers struts. There's confusion as to what you can do with camber plates, camber plates, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, what effect that can have on Miatas, that sort of thing. So this is just a high level video that talks about what the difference between a strut suspension and a multi-link or a double wishbone suspension is what characteristics they have, and why some of the stuff you read about modifying a car like this one that's got struts is different than what you're going to have to do for a car like a Miata that's got double wishbone or multi-link around it. So if you like this kind of content, before we get started, if you like this kind of content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure that you, uh, when you subscribe to the channel, that you sign up for notifications so that you find out when we have a new video coming. We shoot at least one live video a week, and we have new content coming down the pipe all the time. If you like what you see, definitely let us know. Um, if you have questions during this live video, throw them in the comments. We will do our best to answer them live. If you have questions in the future, again, throw them in the comments. We'll answer them in the comments. So, struts versus shocks. Most cars these days have struts. The, the CRX I have here, when Mazda did the original design of the Miata, one of the cars they used the benchmark was a convertible version of this kind of CRX. And it's, uh, it's typical of a lot of front wheel drive, a Econobox, a lot of passenger cars, in that it has a strut suspension instead of a multi, uh, double wishbone or a multi-link. Later, a CR, um, later Hondas, later CRXs, did actually have double wishbone. This one doesn't, so we're using this one. So I'll get into the basics of what the two are, and then we'll get into the characteristics of them, the pros and the cons, and why things like the camera plates on this car would have absolutely no effect on this one here. So the big difference, I'm gonna come over here to that whiteboard in my notes. The big difference is that struts are part of the suspension in terms of they are structural. Um, a strut-based car has a lower control arm. Here's our car over here. Whoop. Lower control arm that goes out to the wheel. You've got your upright here. And then the, the shock absorber is actually attached to that. Usually has a spring on it. Before someone points out, I know this particular kind of Honda has torsion bars in the front. Just pretend it's got a spring. Um, and that goes up here to the car. And then the wheel is bolted on. There's our tire. So what happens is this, this struck, the strut actually helps control where the wheel is. It's attached directly to the upright. Um, and if you take the shock and the strut out, this thing will flop over. The suspension will go all over the place. So this is a very structural part of what's going on the suspension. A multi-link or a double wishbone like the Miata, this is what it looks like from the front of the car, by the way. That's sort of a front view. Multi-link like the Miata will have a lower wishbone that comes out here goes to your upright, and it has an upper one that comes down like this. And those are hinged at these various points, and your wheel comes out here, skinny wheel today. And then your shock is attached somewhere on a control arm and runs up here and has a spring on it. So the difference here is that the spring and the shock absorber don't, hold, they don't affect the geometry of how things are put together. Cornering loads don't go through it the same way, um, basically, it's just there to hold the car up. It's not there to keep this, the suspension in place. And that's the fundamental difference. And it has a big effect on what happens. So let's just have a look. We'll have a look over at the Miata over here. We have Nancy up on the lift. NC and ND Miatas have a double wishbone suspension in the front, and they have a multi-link in the rear. Um, NA and NB Miatas are double wishbone all the way around. The only real difference, multi-link, as you can see, has got multiple arms, thus the name, links. There's five of them in this particular case. That allows for all sorts of interesting geometry tricks, but effectively, they're still, the wheel is located by all of those arms. If I take this shock out, I mean, the car would drop all the way to the ground, but the wheel would stay on its same arc. We have a look on the front here, and this is typical, where to put this on an ND or an NC user. Um, this is typical for Miatas. They are all built more or less exactly the same. This is called a, an A arm sometimes or a wishbone. You can see why it's called an A arm. And then there's a lower wishbone down here as well. And this is just what I sketched on the board. These are the, these are the members that control the location of the wheel. And there's a shock absorber that just holds it up. It doesn't always go through the upper control arm, but it can. 
So, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Let's go back to my notes. Whoop, watch where you're going there, Travis. <laughs> this, end, this video ends abruptly with the camera pointed at the ceiling. You know that Travis tripped over a CRX. So, the big reason you see struts everywhere is that they're, they package really well. They're compact. They don't take up a lot of space in the engine bay um, or in the rear of the car as well. Because they're so simple, they're inexpensive to produce. They're very quick to assemble. It's very quick to service too. Pulling a shock, a strut out of one of these things is usually quite quick and easy. Um, make sure I've got my notes so I make sense. They're so less expensive, better packaging, and less expensive. Again, less expensive, that's important. The downsides are that because this is part of the suspension, it has to deal with cornering loads. So when you're going around a corner and there's a side load on here, some of that side load is going through the strut, which means that there's, uh, there's stiction where the, uh, the, the shaft goes into the strut, into the shock. Um, it's got a side load on it. It doesn't move as smoothly because basically it's being bent at the same time that it's, that it's moving up and down. Um, you have less room, generally speaking, for fat tires in order to keep your other suspension geometry in places. You can have trouble clearing the, sh the spring shock assembly, the strut, um, because otherwise your, your scrub radius and that sort of thing gets all funky. Uh, and one that's very important for us is that it has poor camber gain. In terms of it doesn't, it doesn't add camber as the wheels move up and down, which means if your car rolls in a corner, you'll start losing camber relative to the ground, you'll start losing traction. And that's one of the big reasons why the Mazda engineers went with a double wishbone suspension because of that much better control over the suspension geometry. So cheap, easy, good to package. It's used on some performance cars to good effect. It can be done well, but ideally, if you're starting from scratch, you'll almost always end up with a double wishbone. So again, most of the advantages and disadvantages are flipped. These are more expensive to make. They have more moving parts. I'm just look at the number of bushings and pivot points that are in one of these things, and even one of those multi-links got uh, 10 bushings or, or ball joints on that thing because of all the various arms. Um, they are, the packaging is a little more challenging. You've got more stuff in the way, especially on front wheel drive cars, it makes it harder to get a drive shaft through there. So you don't see it as much on front wheel drive cars especially, although again, Honda managed to make that work. Um, they are more difficult to service. If you ever had to change the front shock on an NA or NB Miata, you know exactly what that means. Um, but they have a lot more design options. Because the location of these various um, points on the chassis, on the control arms, they affect how fast the, the wheels gain camber. Um, on a multi-link, they can also adjust toe as it goes through its travel. Um, you can adjust where the roll centers are. Uh, it's basically, there's a lot more freedom of design. So the complexity comes at a real benefit. And that's why Mazda did it. Um, they, they were looking for the best handling car they could come up with, with a clean sheet of paper. And so even though they weren't using the sort of suspension on a lot of other cars, they went with it on this one. So, camber plates. This is what question we get a lot from Yadis. Oh dear. Uh, question we get a lot from Yadis is basically, can I just put camber plates on it? Why are you messing around with offset bushings, with camber adjusters on here, that sort of thing? Why can't I just put plates on it? This, in this case, the camber of the wheel is determined by where the top of the shock is located. If you move the top of the shock in here, you're gonna turn this whole wheel, give it more camber. You push it out, you give it less camber, you can adjust the camber by simply moving the shock back and forth. And that's what this thing is doing right here. This is a camber plate, that's the top of the shock absorber, and I can, I can decrease the negative camber by moving this outboard, I can increase it by moving it inboard. I can also change the, uh, the kingpin inclination angle by moving the side to side as well. It gives me quite a bit of adjustment over where the suspension goes, but this is all adjustment you can do in the Miata using the, adjust the suspension adjusters. One downside, because these front, uh, these front struts have to move, they also have to rotate in here. As, this, as the steering turns, this, uh, this strut top, or the, yeah, the strut top has to allow for the strut to move or to rotate. So there has to be bearings in here, and those tend to be high wear items. Luckily in the Miata, we can use, literally use solid pieces of steel in some cases with a bit of rubber, but this has to be able to rotate easily. And that's where you hear from a lot of cars with struts, they will wear out eventually on the front. So that's one problem with them, or one reason why you don't use camber plates on Miata is because they wouldn't do anything. Moving the top of the shock around doesn't affect the alignment at all. If we look over here on the car, 
can't see it all that well, but uh, and this thing has got a pivot on here. If I move the move the top of the shock around, it's not going to have any effect on what's going on. This is not really hard mounted to the upright the way it is on a strut car. On a strut car, this would be bolted directly to the upright, so any change in position of the top of that shock, or that strut in that case, would move the wheel around. In this case, taking it out, all it does is control the up and down. One of the reasons that people often say Miatas have struts is because strut cars often have the spring around, coiled around the shock. In other words, a coil over shock assembly, and so these look like struts to people. They don't always have the spring around the shock. This torsion bar Honda doesn't, but usually they do. Um, Double wishbone suspension cars don't necessarily have to, so they're often called struts by people who don't exactly know what's going on because they look like, kind of like struts and because most cars have struts. But purists will say that these are shocks, spring over shock assemblies, coil over shock assemblies. Do we have any questions going on over there, Mike? Yes. So questions about strut braces. Questions, questions about strut braces. Well, that's a good lead in, Mike, because that's my next thing to talk about. Excellent. Again, because this is a structural part of the suspension, cornering loads go through the top of the shock. So if you've got a lot of side push on this, there's side push on the top of the shock absorber too. If, you, if you're accelerating, then the top of the shock is trying to go one way. If you're braking, the top of the shock is trying to go the other way. So basically, all the stuff that's going on at the contact patch is being affected, is affecting the top of the shock. So in this particular case, you know, if I hit the brakes, the top of the shock is going to try to go this way. If I'm accelerating, it's going to try to go this way. If I'm cornering, it's trying to go side to side. On a Miata, that's all independent. It doesn't, all of those cornering loads are taken by the, the wishbones. It's not the shock, it's not trying to rotate the shock. As the wheel rotates here, or it gets, gets loaded up here, all that load goes through the wishbones, or the multi-links, whatever, and the shock is just dealing with vertical loads. That's still a thing. Vertical loads are still important, which is why we do sell shock tower braces. I'll be doing another video on those in a little bit, but they don't have the same sort of wild west, I'm trying to go every single direction thing that you have on a strut brace car. So, it's a different set of design parameters. You know, the triangulation of the firewall is much more important on one like this where the shock towers are trying to move front and back. Um, on a Miata where it's just trying to go up and down, you've got different design decisions to make when you're designing a shock tower brace. So, it leads to some interesting stuff. So, shock tower braces do work, but they're not as critical as they are on a strut brace car especially in the back. Now in the back, I'm gonna pop this open. The shock tops in this thing in the back, this isn't a strut in the back, but whatever, we'll pretend it is. They're back here, which means that there's not a lot of structure between them. And if there's side to side pushing going on, the whole car can sort of flex with it. So that's why you'll often see on high performance hatchbacks, you'll see them add a shock tower brace or a strut brace across there to keep them in place. Not necessary in your Miata, not necessary on a Miata for two reasons. One, not a hatchback. It doesn't have a huge open space in here. The rear shocks are mounted right to a bulkhead that's got the, uh, the rear bulkhead of the car, so it's a very, very strong place, but they're also only going up and down. They're not trying to twist sideways. So rear shock tower braces on a Miata are a complete waste of time, but people put them on because they're extrapolating from things like this. Any more questions, Mike? Clank. It's the sound of the 80s, folks. <laughs> so there, as I said earlier, there certainly are performance cars that have made struts work well. Um, the Toyota FRS GT86 SRV, whatever the heck they call it this week, the twins, they use them to good effect. Um, the Porsche 911 has used struts forever, um, sometimes with torsion bars. I don't know if they've gone to springs on them at all now, but. You can make it work, but they are inherently challenged compared to running a multi-link or a wishbone suspension. Luckily, as a Miata shop, this is all we get to play with, so we're very happy about that. So, that's about all I have to say about struts versus shocks today. Um, if you have any questions about this, this is not intended to be a complete rundown of everything to know about them. It's just fundamentally, why aren't some of these parts important for Miatas? What is it? that is different, so hopefully I've answered those questions. If you do still have questions, throw them in the comments, we will answer them. If you like this set of content, again, don't forget to like our channel, like the videos, comment, and subscribe. We appreciate it. The more viewers we have, the more excuse we have for making good videos. There you go. So that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. My name is Keith Tanner from Fly Miata. Have a good one. <laughs>